All right, we are now live for another reading from my book, Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, the 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France, which came out 10 years ago. Um, I'm a little bit behind the times in that. It only occurred to me I should start doing some readings from the book this year. And we're about, um, well, we're more, more than halfway through it, you can see here by looking at the pages. And today, we're going to begin with a reading of one of the chapters that will probably take us three or four to get through because there's there's quite a bit here. And this is Maurice Blondel's The Problem of Catholic Philosophy, published in Les Etudes Philosophiques, uh, volume seven, number one in 1933. And this is a subtitled Meeting of the Société d'Etudes Philosophiques Presentation of 26 November 1932. And I should say just a little bit about this in terms of format, because what we have here is a presentation by Maurice Blondel. And Blondel at this time was nearly blind. It wasn't easy for him to travel or, you know, go around different places. And, you know, much of what he was doing had to be carried out, you could say, remotely, you know, sort of like what we're doing here. And so he, he has his presentation, and then there are letters, uh, letters that people wrote and that Blondell responded to. Um, Enrico Castelli was one of the letter writers, and then we get um, Blondell's response. Uh, Jean Delvauve, very difficult person to translate because his French is so atrocious, was another one of the philosophers. Uh, then we have Henri Gouillet, the great historian of philosophy, who is involved in this. And then we get a real treat, uh, Joseph Marichal, uh, the great um, transcendental Thomist before Rahner and Lonigan, very influenced by Blondel, by the way. And then after that, there's a, there's a transcript of a discussion that takes place between um, Blondel Jacques Palliard and Gaston Berger. So this is a, a significant portion of the book because there's a lot going on here. So I'm just going to read Blondel's own presentation today and then uh, next time about doing as much of the letters as we can get through. So no further ado, here is The Problem of Catholic Philosophy by Maurice Blondel. Under the name of Christian, or even Catholic philosophy, which has been used in very different ways since the second century and has reappeared down the course of the ages, even on titles of lengthy works, is something else hidden besides a literary expression or a historical label, useful perhaps for designating certain movements within civilization in general, but lacking possible definiteness and technical justification. In short, from the rational point of view, is it not wrong to, for us to speak of a problem that would be up for debate as the object of a critical examination? An examination that, even if it must be concluded with a negation, provides an occasion for deepened analyses and systematic solutions. Many people either have not dreamed of such a question or have decided it was not worth a thorough treatment, because in this verbal reconciliation there would be only a superficial confusion between two domains, having no reason to enter into contact, into agreement, or contact. Philosophy develops itself freely in its plane, which claims its own plenary autonomy and which seems to constitute philosophy in itself. Christianity is something surplus. It justifies itself or works itself out in a plane totally different in its origins, its methods, its aims, and its promises. Consequently, some conclude, there, uh, here we go. Consequently, some conclude these are two lines that cannot cross each other, nor even claim to a parallelism and a convergence towards infinity because it is a matter of heterogeneous planes. One fact, however, constantly ends up contesting this simplistic verdict. There is no encounter, they tell us, no collision between true philosophy and authentic Christianity. 
And yet what spectacles do the insistent antagonisms or the renewed efforts at interpenetration offer us throughout the ages? If this chronic condition possesses an intelligible signification, is it not philosophy's role to seek out its causes and to discern its enduring reasons? For perhaps it is right to repeat about Christianity what Aristotle declared about metaphysics. Here's a footnote. Translators know Lowndell cites both Aristotle and himself here. It is about the supernatural order that it is especially right to repeat the statement of Aristotle about first philosophy. If we must not philosophize, we still must philosophize. One cannot exclude metaphysics except by a metaphysical critique. This comes from Axiom 1893. So back to the text it, itself. Um, and even if we should not do that, well, then let us seek out and understand why it can or must be eliminated. From a first point of view, there is already a problem to scrutinize more closely and more methodically than has typically been done. And our first task is to investigate why people have turned their attention away from a difficulty that nevertheless has never been eliminated. And with a little bit of reflection, we perceive that this deficiency contains another deeper, more intrinsic difficulty, that of precisely determining the real point of encounter between the philosophical spirit and the Christian spirit, as immense as the distance between them seems, even though for so many centuries during the history of thought, this apparently productive distancing has never prevented collisions or alliances between the two great spiritual powers, disputing or sharing between themselves rulership over intellects, and souls. When at the beginning of Christian reflection, St. Justin the philosopher or Clement of Alexandria glimpsed or wished for a philosophy according to Christ, a Catholic gnosis, they anticipated a realization of it that did not lie in their power and that even as St. Augustine did not himself see, except in an implicit way, divided as he was between the customary meaning of philosophy that ancient philosophy already possessed and the aspiration towards a synthesis whose intelligible explanation and satisfactory term the eternal word alone would give by the teaching through which he illuminated reason, and by the good news of the God-man. Between the ancient and cyclical conception of philosophy, whether a rationalizing or an empirical one, and the concrete and infinite ideal of thought, and the destiny proclaimed or imposed by the incarnate words preaching, the abyss was too vast for even the work of genius to possibly fill. Hence the long history of the more or less fortunate, more or less failing or stimulating attempts of a thought that by organizing a closed philosophy and a conceptual order according to Hellenic science's static inspiration, sought at the same time to juxtapose, to superimpose Christian truths on rational truths by fitting them together, so to speak, through theses common to both, but by asserting all the more the supernatural's orders, transcendence, and gratuity. A salutary effort a precious and indispensable distinction, a place for agreement and conversation, but between powers that, if we remain within this conceptual perspective, remain foreign, eccentric, and opposed to each other. It is not surprising, then, that by retaining the ancient ideal of a philosophy sufficing unto itself and finishing itself in concept, some would have avoided, have avoided approaching head-on the question of a true symbiosis of a purely rational activity and of a thought intelligibly submitted to the faith. Instead of an intimate connection allowing a cooperation without confusion, they have instead examined the notional agreement of more or less objectively superimposable doctrines. From such a viewpoint, they have been able to talk about Christian philosophy in three slightly different senses. Before going on to show the deficiencies of these different ways of understanding the litigious expression under discussion, we can summarize them thus. Number one. Certain theses, like the affirmation of God, of the spiritual soul, of personal immortality, are truths that philosophy normally can and even ought to establish in parallel with the revealed teaching that confirms them, provides them precision, and expands them by purifying them from doubts, troubles, and errors. 
Already this consortium of truths common to reason and to faith established, it seems, a solid base for a doctrine meriting the double name of rational and Christian. In this first sense, Christian philosophy appears to bear essentially on a middle zone where two lights converge on ontologically identical objects, despite the formal difference of their modes of knowledge and of certainty. Two, in addition, the Christian contribution has served historically as a vehicle for truths that speculation was not able to discover and that perhaps our naturally weak or accidentally weakened reason would not have been able to attain by its own powers alone. In actuality, the clear idea of creation, for example, was not worked out by reason, and it was the Judeo-Christian revelation that introduced it into the history of ideas and made it available for philosophical thoughts mastication. By right, certain metaphysical truths seem inaccessible to reason, even though, once revealed, they offer to speculation a gripping point. It is legitimate to take advantage of, not in order to violate a mystery, but in order to show in it a consolation rather than a darkening, as is the case for the divine trinity, of which a Plato or others seem to have a vague presentiment, and from which our Christian doctors drew some illuminations suited for removing different objections against the mystery of divine personality. In this sense, Christian philosophy is no longer simple confirmation, but extension and growth for rational thought itself. Three, if the history of concepts was enriched by a sort of secular digestion of partially rationalizable revealed truths, a yet more deeply penetrating justification of Christian philosophy has been proposed, a lived one, little by little, penetrating the entire intellectual civilization and the intellects experiencing in themselves human natures and supernatural graces double labor. In this sense, St. Augustine, St. Bonaventure, and others could speak of a philosophy that is no longer only that of natural reason, but of the new being under the irradiation of the soul and same interior master, the eternal word of God, Christ, mediator, revealer, and redeemer, who imposes on every man coming into the world the same clarity, illuminating from within the same unavoidable destiny. We are far from thinking of failing to recognize such a labor of elucidation and reconciliation's rightness and usefulness. It has contributed to prepare little by little the true problem to raise, not at all by filling the abyss we have seen between ancient doctrines and, quote, philosophy according to Christ, but to the contrary, by making the very conception of philosophy evolve and by preparing discernment of what remains incommensurable between the rational order and the supernatural order, even when set by si side by side. For it is not the interval of concepts that is to be filled. To the contrary, it is reason's insufficiency that must be shown and opened up. Once it is a matter of satisfying our mind's metaphysical demands and of discerning or satisfying the calls of our restless and mysterious destiny. In certain respects, the partial use some have tried to make of revealed teachings has maintained an equivocation that has not always been favorable to the authentically Christian spirit. And if it is true that theological data have often been a philosophical leaven, this fermentation has taken advantage less of certain theses, partially assimil assimilable to this or that rational system, than of an enlivening of the method and the function of philosophy itself. The ideas that a Descartes or a Malbranche were able to lend to the Catholic tradition were, in the speculative use it made of them, contestable or even wrong. But they have contributed to transposing the ancient conception according to which the world is a cyclical order and a hierarchy of fixedly defined forms into a greater problematic, one more moving, more real, more intelligible, and better, a dramatic problem that presents the universe and humanity as the history of a genesis, of an ascension, of an aspiration towards the infinite, or even towards a union unaccessible to man whose natural desire exceeds his very nature. It therefore required centuries and multiple attempts at mutual adaptations of reason and faith in order for a problem to become explicit, a problem implicit from the time of Christian origins on, 
but for a long time masked by an effort of notional concordism when it was really a question of clarifying and justifying a metaphysical possibility, a spiritual grafting, and a vital cooperation. If, since St. Justin, the philosophy according to Christ, drawn on like credit, seemed according to antiquity's reason to have to eliminate philosophy, it could not always suffice during the conflicts or the truces in what appeared an ever-renewed duel to work out peace treaties by marking out the borders or the middle zones of influence, for this again and again always amounts to materializing or conceptualizing the two spiritual powers, meriting this name only if a cooperation, a symbiosis, an into susception replaces the notion of an antagonism or a purely extrinsic complementarity. It was therefore necessary that the philosophy, according to Christ, far from repressing that of the philosophers, welcomed it, animated it, recognized it, and satisfied its most legitimate, its most audacious demands. And this required that if Christianity's reciprocal demands and what was most wounding and in appearance incommensurable for reason in them, by this specifically supernatural rigor became the condition for encounter, for collision, for insertion, from which the philosophical order and the Christian order must doubly benefit. It is, therefore, insofar as the Christian contribution introduces supernatural data and demands that it procures a decisive and elevating renewal for the philosophical spirit, not at all simply by presenting ideas from which reason draws augmented precision and more elaborated systems, of philosophy, as of all the human disciplines, Christian thought has been able to say, Ecce nova facio omnia. Yes, but by a slow and obscure mastication. Assuredly, it would be wrong to fail to recognize the fertility of the historical and speculative effort that has little by little, if one may say so, digested the news comp uh, comprised in the good news. But these particular news only have their meaning and their worth by being referred to the radical and unique newness that has to be envisaged, accepted, incorporated in its integrity. It is to this task that philosophy will itself owe its completeness and comprehensiveness. And it is in this perspective that we can speak not only of a philosophy more or less colored by Christianity, but of Catholic philosophy completely different from a concordist or Christianoid doctrine of which the past offers many examples. Since by wanting to tally up all the actions or reactions the Christian influence has determined, some have gone as far as a Nietzsche and even well beyond him in understanding it. From such a viewpoint, I hope we will admit that the development of modern thought has had this effect of bringing the always looming crisis between rational autonomy and Christian demands to a vital point that historical, exegetical, and apologetic considerations do not reach. Insofar as they appear in isolation without the preliminary question being raised, <clears throat> the question whose precise meaning normal character and essential scope we have just tried to exhibit. Granted, not everyone has the need to pass through this dominating problem, but for the philosopher who wants to and ought to take account for himself of metaphysical possibilities, rational demands, moral legitimacies, and obligations, the problem we have tried to articulate seems inevitable. And it is to the extent that one has resolved it in an explicit or an implicit way that the history of these philosophically Christian efforts takes on their useful meaning, their subordinate value, their preparatory role, their salutary usefulness. Otherwise, rationalist critique would be quite right to triumph over the equivocations, to render justice to all too easy concordisms, to show how the Christian theses cease being Christian in order to become philosophical or cease to be philosophical in order to remain Christian. Otherwise, the modernists would still be led to confuse Christianity's generative idea with the human forms that it has clothed itself in, and that, starting from its origin, seemed to them a perpetual metamorphosis under the backlashes of philosophical speculation or historical contingencies. Nothing of this sort, if at the start the problem of the supernatural is determined in all of its precision by a rational critique that shows its legitimacy and inevitability. How the problem is led by an unbending critique of thought and of life, 
How this examination ends up in a philosophy open not only to a vague and amorphous empty space, but to one that stimulates openings and is capable of providing precision to the ultimatum of a reason that does not remain content with close enough or gratuitous hypotheses, how definite contours, experimental verifications are possible and required. These issues are what we cannot examine here in their indispensable developments. Our intention is only to explain a little of why the problem of a Christian philosophy raised virtually for many centuries has been ordinarily avoided at the least approached off in obliquely method, method, methodically little discussed. How has it become a more pressing, more contemporary, more renewing problem? Why must it not be approached solely from the historical point of view as if it did not remain the doctrinal problem par excellence? Under what multiple aspects does it participate in the permanent and universal character of metaphysical restlessness and in the perenniality of the religious aspiration and of the good news, always new? This is what I have in mind to propose for my friends' reflection and discussion. It is not, therefore, su surprising that many of my correspondents should have been led to enlarge the terms of the debate, for if it is true that from the strictly rational point of view and from the specifically religious point of view, an irreducible heterog heterogeneity and an inevitable solidarity subsist at the same time, our problem, restricted in appearance to a particular case, has us touch on philosophy's summit in its encounter with the question of religion's life or death, of what in religion is positive in living. Yes or no, can philosophy suffice on to itself and suffice for us, isolate itself and close itself off, subjugate the religious sentiment and even the religious idea, and see in the faith only a popular ersatz for science and rational speculation? Or then, must we affirm as philosophers and maintain as men the legitimacy, the reality, the indestructible originality of positive religions, thought, and life in humanity's breast. And in the gaze of metaphysical spe speculation faced with history or in the witness of more and more verified experience, is it not the religious universalist spirit that confers on the God of the philosophers, the vitality lacking which he remains only a still debatable name? about which a debate can be opened, a debate that can hardly be called anything but the debate about atheism. Here's a footnote. Blondel is here referring to the Société Française de Philosophie session of March 1928 bearing that name. Therefore, it is of sovereign importance to be able to examine in all simplicity and entire frankness the dominating question bearing on what has been rightly called the whole of thought and the whole of life. Not that we have here to fix conclusions in their exact content. A too literal conformism is not at all enlivening and cannot suffice for us. Far from that. Nothing ever authorizes exclusion of philosophical freedom, nor failure to recognize an invisible and Catholic soul of truth. Always the use of the means of illumination and charity should be recommended, as should inviolable respect for consciences, the quest for and cult of peace and ardent cooperation of minds who have to show the value of their investigations and their convictions solely by the arms of light, per arma lucis. It is on this last aspect that I would like to end this brief summary. For our dialogues will not be useless if we succeed even feebly in favoring the realization of the wish that Mr. De Volve sends us from Toulouse by our very discussions to produce an assimilation and a deepening of rational speculation and of religious tradition for reestablishment of spiritual communion. That is where Maurice Blondel's presentation ends. And um, what follows are the letters received regarding Mr. Maurice Blondell's presentation with responses by Mr. Blondell. As I mentioned, we have um, four of these sets of letters. <clears throat> um, one set by Enrico Castelli, um, interesting uh, uh, Italian philosopher, who's also, if I remember right, a go-between uh, at one time between Heidegger and Blondell. Uh, Mr. Jean Delvolve, and then uh, two really important uh, figures, Henri Gouillet, the really great historian of philosophy. I don't think a lot of his works have been translated, unfortunately, but he is just a giant in French history of philosophy. And then Joseph Maréchal, the Jesuit 
who um, unfortunately was never allowed by the Jesuits to teach graduate level classes uh, for, for, I forget the reason exactly why, but he is one of the fathers of transcendental Thomism. So they write letters, Maurice Blondel responds to them, and then there's a discussion between Blondel, Jacques Palliard, and Gaston Berger uh, covering these issues as well. And so it's it's a quite a, a lengthy part of the book, it runs from page 182 to page 224. So, you know, we're talking about uh, over 40 pages in a book that is overall uh, a little over 300, right? So we'll pick up with uh, some of that next time. Uh, again, the book is Reason Fulfilled by Revelation, 1930s Christian Philosophy Debates in France. So now we got some time for some uh, discussion and Q&A. Uh, a lot of people saying hi. Uh, Charlie says, I love your work. It's so insightful. Thanks. That's nice to hear. Uh, it, it doesn't always feel that way um, as you're doing the work. <laughs> it's, it's like anything else. When you see how the sausage is made, you know, you have a very different perspective on it. Mario says, would you say philosophers are more demanded than ever in the age of AI? So uh, everything turns on the word demanded. Uh, is there a greater demand, like a market demand for philosophers? I would say, no, not really. I mean, there have always been intelligent people outside of philosophy doing things who said, oh, we need to bring in somebody who knows about this, this area, you know, could be like uh, uh, how formal systems work or it could be ethics or it could be whatever you want. Um, but unfortunately, I would say most people in the business world they know very little about philosophy and, and, and a lot of what they think they know about it is unfortunately like stuff that's not real philosophy, but just sort of pre-digested things, you know, what they learned from their instructor about what Aristotle said. And Aristotle was an empiricist, which is not actually true. Um, but if you're talking in the moral sense, uh, you know, should philosophers be involved in discussions about AI and its many uses and its extension into things. Absolutely. I mean, you know, philosophers should be and are involved in discussions about whether there is such a thing as AI or whether this is just a big metaphor. Same thing with like machine learning. It's not really learning in a, in a real sense, uh, but it's, it's an interesting set of processes. And, you know, what are the dangers on the horizon? What are the things that we're overlooking? What are the ethical quandaries that are going to come up because of uh, AI and it's many different uses. What what counts as AI? You know, clarifying that. Yes, I would say that um, philosophers do need to be involved in that. I don't know that that has much to do with the Christian philosophy debate, other than to say that, you know, in a very broad sense. So Blondell is signaling that philosophy as a, a wide field and Christianity um, can't can't really avoid each other. And when they try to, when, when philosophy says, oh, that's irrational, that doesn't mean anything, philosophy loses some of its philosophic nature. Um, Christianity, likewise, when it, when it tries to impose on philosophy, hey, just, just do the philosophy that's going to you know, provide us the apologetics we need, it, it actually becomes, in some respects, non-Christian. Um, and, and I would say today that there are many people out there masquerading as Christians in our culture who aren't remotely Christian are actually anti-Christ. Um, and, you know, that's a much larger conversation to have. But philosophy could play a role in helping to discern those sorts of things. Um, and there are Christian philosophers engaged with that, that sort of thing. All right, any other questions, comments, issues about uh, what we covered with Blondell? the uh, topic of Christian philosophy, um, the historical, doctrinal, um, methodological connections that he sees as important in bringing a crisis to, to bear. Uh, Mario, as a follow-up, I'm asking because I'm doing a MC, a Master's of Science, I guess, in digital leadership and new age technologies and part-time learning all great philosophical works like Heidegger, Hegel, Nietzsche, and even Stoics. Yeah, I mean, all, all of those thinkers actually have something to say about technology. So I think that, you know, that is, is relevant. 
Um, there's plenty of others as well. So, yeah. Um, Roughly Bumble has a good question here. Do any of the 1930s thinkers offer any thoughts on the Christian understanding of the soul during the, the debate? Yes and no. So nobody in the course of the debates is saying, all right, I'm going to take a step back and focus just on this issue and not look at the larger um, context. So I'm going to do a treatise on the soul or something like that. Um, there are some, you know, discussions of it, for example, in Gilles Sohn's The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, where he's, he is taking the historical approach that Blondell is saying isn't, isn't enough. And Blondell is right about that, by the way. Um, Blondell's position and Gilles Sohn Maritain's position are actually complementary to each other, as many of the people in the debates pointed out. Um, I wouldn't say that there's, there's like any advance in like proposing new new understandings of the soul in, in the course of these debates. That said, um, a lot of these thinkers in their other works are definitely discussing the soul. So, you know, Blondel, Marcel, um, you know, Martin, um, Gilson, as I mentioned, um, even some of the rationalists like Brehier, you know, in his history of philosophy, he's interested in what people thought about things. So even though he doesn't accept these ideas, he, he will talk about, you know, Christian ideas of the soul. So do they offer insights? Um, not any really new insights in the debates, but, um, you know, they certainly... Uh, highlight the importance of like understanding a person as a person as something that develops in, in significant part through Christianity. Um, and it's not as if the pagan thinkers didn't have any notion of that, but like Blondell pointed out, there's often ideas that put into a, a new context, suddenly people can see what's there. Um, and we can say this not just about Christianity, we can say this about other respects in which we expand our viewpoint. You know, the technology thing is a great example. Um, we inhabit a very different world now than even just like Heidegger did back in the 50s, 60s, um, you know, uh, let alone back in 1928 or anything like that. It's, it's, we are in a different environment and we have new philosophical issues that aren't totally radically new, they're actually informed by other thinkers. Think about Aristotle and what he has to say about technology and power relations and stuff like that. Um, but we can get a different point of view on it. And I, I kind of think that, you know, when it comes to issues like the soul or human nature, these are things that, you know, there are many viewpoints on, but all of those viewpoints are at best partial and not fully adequate. And we're still in the process of figuring out what the hell we are, you know? like with human nature. Um, all right, so Ricky has a question. What did Blondell's contemporaries think of him? They loved him and they hated him. Um, as a matter of fact, that goes on even today where there's still a lot of uh, basically ignorant people out there who hate Blondell just because of what other people back then said about him. Um, Blondell's thought was so influential that he is often talked about as the philosopher of Vatican II. Um, and if you read uh, Jean-Paul II's Fides et Ratio about Christian philosophy, Blondell is not mentioned in it, and that's because Blon it's a Blondellian document. So he has had massive influence. Um, he was hated by quite a few of the Catholic thinkers of his time, who I actually consider to be, in, in many respects, deficient Catholics, like um, Garagou Lagrange, who, who attacked Blondell's work and admitted that he couldn't understand Blondell's work. Um, but there were many who really, well, and I'll also say too, Gilson and Maritain didn't like Blondell. And a lot of that was like personality conflict stuff, which is kind of weird. Um, there were a lot of uh, French thinkers who thought that Blondel was probably one of the most important thinkers of the 19th and 20th centuries. And it included many Thomists, including somebody who we're going to get to a little bit later in the book, um, Antonin Sertillage, who is, uh, yeah, oh, that, that's coming right after this in, in chapter eight. And Bruno de Solage and 
um, Henri de Lubeck and, you know, all, all these other thinkers. So Blondell is, is fairly neglected these days, um, but he is a first rate philosopher who um, people recognized as such at the time. John says, uh, I have no questions yet. Thank you, as always, for your work. Oh, you're very welcome. So any other questions, comments, things people want me to tackle? Otherwise, we'll uh, end a little bit early and I'll get to my classwork. My students are totally burnt out in their last week of class uh, at one place and the second to last week of class in another it has been a very tough semester for these poor kids. Um, and it doesn't, I was just talking with a colleague, is it going to get better in the spring? Probably not. You know, we're probably, we have another year to grind out maybe before we start to get back to something resembling normalcy. Uh, but that's a total side note, not related to this Christian philosophy stuff. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'll I'll say next week uh, doing another reading, continuing on in this this section. And thanks for all of your questions and comments. Um, and um, I'll see you next time.